Wonderful. So um, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for, for joining again. This is the third installment of Max introduction into quantum mechanics for non-physicists and and we have been going for a lot of mathematics and today Max promised to to actually go beyond mathematics and tell us something about physics and real experiments and how to understand from experiments how we think about quantum mechanics today and i thank him very much for for preparing all this again and i thank everybody for joining in especially also from remote jan and ulrich hi guys so i hope you can hear us give us a quick hand if you can't aha uh -huh. no but i think uh you can hear us otherwise you would already be sending emails so and with this i'm giving over to max and see yeah. where we are going with quantum mechanics and quantum information today. So thank you all for joining again. Um, today I'm going to um, make a quick step back from the thing we did last time. So last time, if you remember, we introduced the Schrodinger equation and um, the Hamil um, hamilton octon operating system as the um, <coughs> quantization of, for, of classical mechanics. And then we introduced a quantity called the wave function, which we said we cannot really measure the wave function, but it's absolute square we can interpret it as a, a probability density <coughs> on how, where a particle in a certain volume is. So I know that this was pedagogically not um, really hard to understand, so now we're going to look at a, uh, we're going to abstract this a bit and go to a more uh, higher order principle on how to uh, measure things in quantum mechanics and to get a better understanding of what this wave function is actually is here. All right, so first we're going to look at the experiment called the stern goddard experiment. And then we use this experiment as an example of how to measure um, <coughs> measure quantities in quantum mechanics and introduce a more general formalism than the one we just saw called the direct formalism. And after that, we will look at a, the simplest two-level system you can think of, or the simplest non-trivial quantum mechanical system one can think of as a two-level system. And from this on, from this system on, we will motivate how to do, how, or how to build a computation machine using two-level system states. What is a two-level system? You will see. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Afterwards, um, we should have a um, motivation on how to do this. And then I'll switch to a, a PowerPoint and show you the basics of quantum computing, how to process bits in a quantum mechanical sense. All right, let's start. So, um, Stern and Gerlach <coughs> did a very nice and simple to explain experiment. What they did was they um, heated up silver atoms in an oven. And um, through the oven, there was this little hole in there where silver atoms were able to escape. And uh, in a beam, which was collimated, which means you have sharpened the beam. And then you send the <coughs> you send the uh, beam of silver atoms to an inhomogeneous magnetic field. And back there, they had a, <coughs> they, uh, had a, um, a detector to see where all the silver atoms hit after, certain, after they went through a magnetic field. And um, before we think about um, what uh, why, uh, what happened, what, actually, what they actually measured, we should motivate why they did it. So a uh, silver atom, um, <coughs> has um, uh, 40, uh, 47 <coughs> electrons. 
And what you would like to know is, does this, um, does this, uh, do the electrons or does the whole silver atom carry a net angular momentum? What is an now we can ask what is the angular momentum? Um, so in classical mechanics, the angular momentum is a quantity, a vector quantity, the cross product between the um, a position of a particle and its momentum. And if you have like a circular orbit there of a particle, which just circles around, <clears throat> the angular momentum will always be a quantity with a direction being um, trans transverse to the um, transverse to the uh, uh, circular motion. <clears throat> and um, from uh, elect uh, from looking at electrodynamics, we know that um, uh, that charges <clears throat> in a uh, in a, a fixed orbit across the circle around here, create also something called the magnetic dipole moment. Which is, which we call mu, and which is proportional to the angular to the angular momentum of a particle. <clears throat> and um, if we have an, um, if you apply a mag magnetic field to a charge, can you symbol? Uh, this is this here is uh, proportional to no the a J J and oh, okay. um, J and yeah. <clears throat> um, we know also that uh, if you are applying a magnetic field to this setup. Um, and, um, the action energy uh, of the uh, magnetic dipole moment and the magnetic field um, which is negative between the dipole moment and the magnetic field And so if you assume that we have a, um, that, uh, that um, potential also leads to a force, which I showed you the last time, that for instance, the, um, the force is, as, as we know from the last time, um, that a, f a force can be written as the, as minus the um, uh, gr uh, gradient of the potential. And if you apply just this fact we learned the last time to our system in the z direction, we would need the, um, the derivative in the z direction of our potential energy. <clears throat> and um, this, in this case, um, would be um, proportional um, to the z component of the um, angular momentum times the gradient of our magnetic field in the C direction. <clears throat> or um, um, 
if you write down the if you just look at uh, if you just look at the um, again at the C component and carry out the um, scalar product between the magnetic moment and the uh, magnetic field. And just like a scalar quantities, you will arrive at the expression which is um, which contains the angle between the um, magnetic dipole moment and the gradient in the z direction of the magnetic field. Okay. So this. So if a silver atom which we just looked at has any angular momentum at all, or any net angular momentum to its electron movement, we should see a deviation based on this line of thought. Just because <clears throat> if there would be no net angular momentum at all, we would expect that the silver atoms should, be, because they are like also electrically neutral, neutral, they should just fly through. If there's any angular momentum at all, um, it, the amount of deviation which they have, so let's just draw this again. Um, we have here our silver atom beam. And here our magnetic field. So the angular momentum of the Silver atoms should shouldn't have any preferred direction when they're coming out of the oven. We didn't tell them to like oh align all your if you have an angular momentum align them somewhere. Um, we wouldn't we don't we don't tell them to do that. So we would expect that they should be uh, that the amount of deviation they have should be equally distributed. <clears throat> And um, so, so we would expect the following setup. Um, on the left, we would see, okay, the silver atoms have a, just uh, uh, get deviated because we don't, in a, uh, in a normally distributed way because we don't have any preferred direction. But that's where it got interesting. Um, what Stern and Gerlach actually measured was um, that silver atoms got all got deviated in two directions. <clears throat> instead of a, instead of a, um, ins instead of a equally distributed uh, uh, in an equal distributed way. <clears throat> and so, right, so the, on the right you see the, so how the, atom, uh, how the atoms came out of the magnetic field, and here we see it again. So this was the classical prediction, equal distributed um, silver atom beam, and here uh, actually what was actually observed by them, um, two preferred directions. So somehow, they just show, so if you think now back, okay, this somehow measures a bit, uh, or this somehow measures our angular momentum. And we thought, okay, our angular momentum is somehow equally distributed without any preferred directions. And now suddenly we only measure that the head angular momentum of the silver atoms has two preferred, has only two preferred directions. It's somehow quantized. Why did they choose silver? Something special about um, In the end, yes. Um, silver, so the uh, silver atom has, um, it is, it's 46 closed atomic shells, so it means they don't have any net angular momentum. And the 47th uh, uh, electron in silver also, also does not have an angular momentum, but it has another uh, uh, no, um, orbit angular, orbit angular momentum, but another kind of angular momentum called a spin, which I will show you later. 
They didn't know that they, they were actually pretty lucky. Got lucky. This <laughs> is yes, the short answer. Yeah. <laughs> lucky, yeah. Almost always is the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, before we uh, explain what, hap what actually happened there, let's have a quick look back on what this apparatus actually does to our system. So. What we do here is um, we prepare a system in a state. And um, instead of um, using the uh, wave function, which I introduced in last time, we will change the notation again to something more generally. We will say that the system is in something, is in a state called psi, which is um, called a cat. We note it like that. And this cat is a vector in the element out of some Hilbert space. If you remember, a Hilbert space is a linear space with the inner product again in a few mathematical things aside so we write this just with just a change of notation nothing too serious we say this is out of some Hilbert space coming <laughs> it's just a vector just imagine it to be a vector without any written without any base psi is a vector no it's a vector, uh, something out of the Hilbert space. It can be something from an LP space, or Why do we need pipe and an angle bracket around this? Just that's a, a, that's a symbol. It's just a symbol for that. What does it mean? It's a vector. It's, a vector. it's like a different symbol for a vector. Yeah. yeah. A vector because we had the arrow on top. So yes. Now <laughs> a different vector. Yes, it's a vector. It's a convenient notation which we will use later. They just wrote it down because uh, it makes a. It makes writing a scalar product easier, later, uh, inner product easier later. I have <laughs> to believe <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> and we force this uh, vector psi to have, if you write the inner product, we have an inner product on this Hilbert space again. Okay. And we will force this psi to, if we take the inner product with itself, to equal one. So imagine you are in the two-dimensional space, in an R2, for instance. And you would just take vectors which lie on the unit circle, like this. So if you draw a circle in two dimensions around the origin, you would only take those vectors in your space. I can see that. Everything that's contained, everything that has no one. So, so this H is now unit spheres in the main, in, in, in the main, yes, exactly. Okay. So it's in uh, arbitrary space, like, the states you actually take out of the H are in the units. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, what is now this symbol here? So we took the inner product and we have, I haven't actually told you what this here is. Um, this is, <laughs> this is, this is, um, this symbol here is called uh, a bra vector. Um, and um, what the what it is? What it's um, it is a linear um, a linear mapping from the. From your uh, Hilbert space into the complex numbers. What you do here is simply is a, is a notation 
you say, okay, I have a vector from my uh, Hilbert space and <coughs> uh, convert it into this um, and convert it into this bra vector. If you have like C is some complex number, we can write in front of the um, in front of the vector. Just say we simply convert this vector into the bra by this convention, and we say that um, our inner product consists of taking a bra times a cat gives us the inner product. That's the idea behind it. Can you repeat maybe this with the transpose? And As, oh, yes, yes. So um, if you think about the inner product again, so this in, the, in uh, C to the power n, this, if you, ha if you have, imagine this cat vector would be something from C, of C to the power n, like from a complex, would be a complex vector with complex entries. Then, the corresponding cat vector would be again the um, um, the, uh, con the complex communication of the vector and taking the transpose. So um, just write it down again. Um, Goes to be um, the transposed. The, we take the transpose of the vector and complex conjugated. This is what this bra means. Uh, this bra means in this case. So the cat transposed is the bra. bra. Yes. From this, this is just a change of notation, which is a maybe you write that down. As well. Yeah. <clears throat> Completely lost now. <laughs> I have no clue what happened. Okay. Um, that's the third notation for vectors we have been introducing. Why can't we just use one? <laughs> <laughs> we want to distinguish between the spatial vectors and the Hilbert space vectors. Exactly. Why do we want to do that? Because they are two different, they have two different meanings. The Hilbert space vector is a state. And the spatial vector is a point in the space. Maybe, maybe for a computer scientist, the input to the state vectors are spatial vectors, for example, positions. So they have a special meaning at a certain position. In the same. The vectors that you know normally, spatial vectors that point to a position somewhere are in many senses very similar to the vectors we have been talking in Hilbert space. But what is a bit complicated is that these uh, vectors in Hilbert space actually can have parameters like spatial vectors. They can have parameters. They can have parameters like a function. And have an X, Y, Z. So it has nothing to do with vectors anymore. They act like vectors. You can add them, you can. Then we need to define what they do and what those entities behave. Like, do they even consist of numbers anymore? Can I do plus on them? Yes. Like, yes. like what entities are those? Vectors. What's the rule? Vectors. vectors. You can plus. It just said to me it's not a vector because it can have, have attributes. Still a linear vector space. Uh, the interesting thing here is that what you know as a vector yes. that does plus and minus and can be multiplied by yeah, something. I have an arithmetic on it. Yeah. Yes. yes. This is actually but what you, you usually use are these spatial vectors in R3. Yes. Or if I talk about like the feature vectors for certain like image recognitions and stuff. Yeah, but those are different. Those are also vectors. And but those are vectors, yes. And the functions we're talking about are also vectors. 
they behave exactly in every sense like all the applicable vectors given a certain mathematical definition of the vector is. So all of these vectors behave in the exact same way as all the other vectors. Same arithmetic. We need to write them because the new notation, mm -hmm. uh, not so before that, I just always wrote if I wanted to have a vector, I wrote something like V with an arrow on it. For example. For instance. Yes. And if I wanted to, and I also showed you the, the wave function the last time, and also, also the, all of the L2 space. And for this, I always, always wrote something like, something like this here, like the, u r of x if u is something from the L2 space. The, the function. That's a function. Everybody. That's a function here, yes. This is a function. Yes. So now I want to bundle all of both notations together into one convenient notation. Function Put this all okay. together in the block in the in the in this in this one formalism. You just say, okay, if anything is out of some Hilbert space, doesn't matter if it's a function from a function space or a vector space. Or a finite dimensional vector space, like your complex vector space or real numbers, we bundle mm -hmm. all of this together into one notation now. And we don't think about if this thing is actually a function or a vector in the. So, so this pipe and closing angle bracket, it doesn't do anything. No. It's not an operator. It's not an operator, no. It's not a, like it's not, it doesn't do something to this psi. So if I wrote this psi alone, it has the same meaning. Like, so like this here. Just a notation. It's just a notation. You just bundle this, those two, those two things into this here. And you don't think about you. You write it in a more abstract way, so in a sense, you just don't. You just don't care in the first type what it actually is now. I'm the adder here. I'm just a notation. It it's just a, just a notation in this case. Yeah, but what's the intent of the notation? Maybe wait a bit. Yeah. Because, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the interesting thing is we what we did now is that we created a notation, and we can already do in that notation or, or simplify that notation. If you saw this uh, complex conjugate, now if, if you do a complex conjugate of your psi call this the bra and you bring them together and it already looks graphically to remind you of the inner product. So that's a very convenient notation to tell you now you're doing an inner product because it looks exactly like your inner product. If you bring your bra and your cat together, it's the exact notation of your inner product. The bra was the left side. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Because both of them then from the verb bracket, like a bracket. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> this is so but now I have two pipes in the middle. Yes, but um, in total, the shorthand notation for this is. So this is equivalent to <laughs> having one pipe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the scalar product is a multiplication. Actually, yes, between those multiplication yeah. of the vector with its with its complex conjugate yeah. and transpose. Transpose yeah. commutative. Mm -hmm. Complex. Con you have you can exchange the argument. Yes, you can exchange it, but you have to take the complex conjugate of it because that was one of the. So you can take a bra vector, take the complex conjugate, and it's cat vector. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. You can continue if you want. Okay. <laughs> um, where this so just another motivation why this is convenient. Um, so um, if we write down an orthonormal basis like we had the last time. Uh, 
of our Hilbert space. Then if you remember the example which we did the last time that we can represent an arbitrary vector by, an, by our orthonormal base, simply by taking the inner product between our vector and the one of the base vectors. So this would be now a okay, case. So if we, this is what we did the last time, just in our new notation now. We have, we have, we take any vector from our Hilbert space and represent it in a, in a orthonormal base. And we do this by knowing those coefficients, Cm, simply by <clears throat> taking the inner product between them and writing uh, and um, taking the inner product between them and the summation between the coefficients and the base vectors gives then our vector of any of our arbitrary state in, this, in the Hilbert space. All right. Okay. I know this is a lot to, to process, but bear with me just a bit. <clears throat> um, what was our, um, so what, what was our um, stern gerlach apparatus too? So we were preparing a system In some state, arbitrary state, doesn't matter. In this case, our silver atoms coming out of the, in the Stern Gallup case, coming out of the oven. Then we sent them through a measurement apparatus. And came out with a different state or uh, the outcome state, which we actually measure, measured. <clears throat> um, what is happening here in this measurement? Um, so this measurement shall be um, uh, described by something that we call an observable. Okay. Which we say is a <clears throat> An observable is a, a Hermitian operator from H, now Hilbert space. Going back, Hermitian meant that taking the uh, um, the complex conjugate and transpose the operator is again itself. So, and the consequence of this is that um, these only have uh, real eigenvalues. And since they have eigenvalues, they, only, they also have eigenvectors. And their eigenvectors <clears throat> um, form a base of our Hilbert space. Okay. 
and our uh, eigenvalues are the values that we measure in the experiment. Since they are only real quantities, that's the only way to go. Okay. Okay, so um, before the measurement, um, Psi, we can wrap Psi in this uh, space of what we just called the observable. These are eigenvectors of uh, the thing we wanted to measure. <clears throat> and um, if we will now go through our measurement apparatus and we measure a certain Um, um, a certain eigenvalue, um, and our system will afterwards be. in the um, eigenstate corresponding to this eigenvalue called alpha m. It's very <laughs> making me a bit anxious. <laughs> um, so uh, just to remember what's an um, eigenstate, So if we apply this operate to eigenstate, the operator simply just stretches or contracts the vector here to scalar. And this is in this case our real a real quantity because we only measure using Hermitian operators. <laughs> And um, what is the probability? So now we can only say, if we have a system uh, prepared in a certain state, we can only say, uh, what is the probability of a certain measurement out outcome? Just ask a general question. Is it, I'm, I'm a bit confused about the mapping between a, something you can physically measure and a Hermitian operator. Is there some guarantee that anything you can measure is a Hermitian operator or? Yes. Um, <laughs> okay, if you have some, uh, so. Keep it simple. I <laughs> you only want to measure uh, real quantities. Yeah. You, can, you cannot measure anything complex yeah, okay. by any sense. A Hermitian operator only has real eigenvalues. So that's the way to go. Non-Hermitian non operators, um, are, if you can think, so this is always my intuition behind Hermitian operators, why you use them. Um, also, their uh, base sets are uh, uh, orthogonal to each other. So each eigenvector is orthogonal to each other. So it's, um, uh, it's a convention that would put, uh, or like, the only thing that would put forward. I don't, uh, I don't have a better intuition. I don't know if any one so of the- Any crazy observation you could dream up will 
correspond to some Hermitian operator. Yeah, in the middle of column mechanics. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Good enough. So I, I think that, that is very important yeah. in the context of quantum mechanics. Every I would rather phrase it that way. Yeah, that's the definition of the quantum mechanics description of a, of a certain measure of quantity is a Hermitian operator. Okay. Okay. Just so you see. And um, to just say that the uh, um, that the probability of measuring um, certain eigenvalue simply the absolute square of the inner product between the corresponding eigenvector and the state we prepared. Um, so write that down again. Psi. Then we somehow go through the measurement apparatus, which corresponds to the Hermitian operator. We have a certain probability for each state, uh, for each eigenstate to occur out of this measurement. And afterwards, our system will be in the corresponding eigenstate to the eigenvalue which we measured. So this is <laughs> this is a postulate to, to measure this. It's not something you, uh, this cannot be uh, explained by it uh, or like, it has a deep uh, implication, of course, because somehow our, if we look at how we wrote, our, how we can write a general state in our, <coughs> um, in our basis of the, uh, of, of the observable, um, the, uh, the system somehow decides on one state with a certain probability. So, so every, every, everything that makes quantum mechanics complicated is in that simple thing. In the, in the probability. Because there are two things happening. Maybe you should repeat them. <coughs> in the, in the, so back there in that box, two things are happening. So, uh, first of all, the, um, the uh, um, state, the uh, eigenvalue is measured, and then also the system decides on the so and the, the system decides on the uh, eigenvector uh, on. Now, first of all, it de uh, decides on the uh, um, state which will come out with a certain probability, and then the state will actually come out. So the, so the wave function somehow contracts to one eigenstate which we can measure. Given that we, is that what you meant? Okay, so we have somehow our wave function collapses to one eigenvector <laughs> instead of being writable uh, to uh, being written in the in the space notation. Everything you will ever hear about complexity in mechanics. All this, all this about both particle and the wave is in there. All about the different interpretations of quantum mechanics is in these two simple terms. Okay, that was a lot to take into account. Any questions by any chance? Maybe, maybe you should <laughs> explain this in terms of what happens in Stern Keller. Yes, that's my next point. <laughs> um, uh, so, what is happening in Stern Keller? <laughs> so, we saw that our um, so we saw that our um, uh, 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 
silver atoms only uh, had two uh, only split up in, uh, in two directions instead of the expected um, um, instead of the expected deep equally distributed directions. So somehow, yes, this was the first indication of that uh, of a new kind of angular momentum being intrinsic to any particle, which is called uh, spin. Um, it is an uh, inherent quantity of each particle. And um, we shall call the uh, operator describing it simply S. And since it's uh, since uh, angular momentum is a three-dimensional quantity, it also the corresponding. Um, <coughs> The corresponding uh, operator has um, three is a, a, a three-dimensional um, quantity, um, and uh, what we and I'm going to skip ahead here a bit. Um, we cannot measure two uh, uh, two of those or all of those components uh, at the same time. This has something to do with the fact that if you measure the one thing, it will, it will without any doubt, um, <clears throat> influence the measurement of the next component. So we have to go to something different. We have to go to, um, we will, instead of looking at the, uh, at the, each component of the angular momentum, we look at the square at the square, so the scalar product between the uh, uh, with its, so the inner product with the of the operator with itself. <clears throat> and I'm going to just give you the result of what the eigenstate of this operator looks like. H H squared. So now you ask, okay, H squared S, what is S now? <clears throat> this is the uh, spin uh, quantum number. And this is pretty fundamental. So uh, S, so um, if, <clears throat> um, If the spin number is a whole number, so like uh, zero, one, two, and so on, we call those particles bosons. For instance, and an ins for instance, of instance, a boson is the photon. Which has been one, or the carrier of the strong nuclear force, the gluon, also has been one, or the um, Higgs boson, there's a special role in there, has been zero. So if you apply to the, if you apply to the state vector of the photon, the um, the uh, spin, the spin operator, or the square of the spin operator, you get a one for the S. And uh, half-numbered spins um, 
Those are called fermions. The electron, for instance, has spin one half. Or the quarks, the uh, components of the of, of the proton or the neutron also have spin one half. Interestingly, those so you say that bosons are so-called force carriers and fermions make up our stable matter. <clears throat> and um, coming back to how those um, eigenstates look like. So we can also measure the Z component in those eigenstates of our spin, which simply looks like this. An H bar. And M in this case goes from minus S to S. And now, okay, a lot of things, lots of things to, I wrote down there. <clears throat> what we measured here was the spin in the Stern Galaxy spin was the spin of an electron. We just told you that the electron has a spin number of one half, and we measured only the C component. So for the electron, we have <coughs> M plus minus one half. So all the, so this number M goes from, goes in whole, goes in, uh, goes from minus one half to plus one half. From the Z component. Bernard, you looked lost. Okay. I dropped out the okay, yes. like, um, to I'll try to. I'll, uh, no. Okay. Don't bother. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, um, these states, we cannot change the inherent quantity of a fundamental particle of a of, of the electron. The electron, we cannot simply apply operate and somehow get an electron of with a spin of three halves out of it. So this, um, <clears throat> this, uh, this, these eigenvectors which I just described can just be characterized by the Z component or by the M value I just showed you. But just writing down plus one half and minus one half. Or in a shorthand notation, um, we will just write down um, 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 zero for the minus one half component, or one for the plus one half state. And this is the, uh, so, so now we have a system which just has two eigenvectors and the corresponding Hilbert space is therefore only two dimensional because we only have two eigenvectors there. How are we doing with time? Uh, it's three. Exactly three? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, this is the uh, sim so this is um, the simplest thing you could imagine non-trivial quantum system can have the system with two states in there. 
And as I've written down here, um, these systems with only two states, where you have one corresponding, uh, where you could just write down one corresponds to a one and a zero, gives you somehow an intuition that, wait, we have now a binary system somehow, and our classical computation also works with binary computations. Can we somehow use those kind of systems, this class of systems of, with only two states, call it two-level system, to do something like a computation machine on it? Like because, and we can manipulate a state to go from one to zero and from zero to one. Isn't that somehow, could it be somehow intuitive to a bit, like a quantum uh, analogon to a bit? And this thing here, this simple system is what we should, what we call a, uh, what we can call a quantum bit, a system which only has two states in it. And where we can, where we are allowed to manipulate between both states so that we can make one bit go to, from zero to one and from one to zero and perform on multiple of those systems arithmetic on it, which we can then interpret as integer numbers. So imagine you have a, You have um, multiple systems. Then um, we can write that. So we have. Um, <clears throat> So each of those cats corresponds to a to, to one system. This is the state vector of one system, and we have multiple ones lined up together. We can write this more comfortably by in only one cat. This is a shorthand notation. one cat where we separate all the um, <coughs> all the uh, system, all the uh, system numbers by a, by a comma and um, for instance imagine like a system also two level system which looks like this uh, zero one zero one for a four level system for instance this would be correspond to one particle being in the zero state, another particle being in the one state, another particle being in the zero state, another particle being in the one state. We just have those different particles somehow in an experimental setup lined up and now and interpret the sequence of quantum numbers here as a binary integer. Could there be a comma between the last oh, yes, zero yes, and the one? Right, sir, yes. Okay. Yes. See, you're not lost. <laughs> Definitely not lost. Binary. And from this on, we'll now move forward to think: Can we can we build something like a quantum computer from this? Because we just saw that. One, that those quantum states, which we just wrote down as a um, in uh, as a superposition of base states, for instance, has can have, can have some interesting prop prop uh, properties. Um, and um, with this, uh, are we still do we, do we still have time, or I, we are five minutes over? So. Okay. Uh, the question is, when do you want to make a cut? I would say I would now make the cut. Okay. Um, I still have a presentation prepared how to develop the, how to utilize this mm -hmm. two-level system 
actually put a lot of contribution from this. Especially one remark again. Um, if I have uh, if I have a n if I have a system of n two uh, of n of those two level systems, the corresponding Hilbert space has a, is of dimension two to the power power n, for instance. <coughs> so we have a really exponential large Hilbert space, and if you for instance, imagine a two to the power 100 large Hilbert uh, vector space, and you want to do like matrix dynamization in it. That's already impossible on a classical quantum or a classical computer, because the number is so exponentially large. It somehow points to the also to the fact that um, quantum systems uh, are exponentially hard to simulate on classical computers on the computers we use from day to day. And, but if we could build a computing machine based on those on those principles, we may be we may be, be able to utilize this fact to get more uh, to get a uh, to get uh, tractable or like handleable simulations of Many body systems, yeah, of multiple particles, for instance, because like that's all uh, Attila and I are working on. We just simulate um, <clears throat> systems of many particles which have an uh, which have an exponentially large Hilbert space, and we cannot really track that. So you have to either use uh, simplifications on your classical computer, or you do exponentially many calculation steps, like Tobias does. Or this is the third and most powerful feature, probably, of if you would have a quantum computer, you could simulate many body systems in a uh, in a reasonable amount of time. And now we are st uh, I'm stopping here. I still haven't gotten everything correct, but I think that's all the basic concepts I wanted to show you today. And if we have any time for another talk, we can uh, develop this. I can show you how to develop this from a list of the computations on this three level system. I, I have one specific question. I, I did not really get how, how the, why did we do Strand Gala? To give them better. For me, it was uh, easier to explain the measurement process. So it's still quite opaque, but the general uh, framework of a two-level of like a two-level system is easier to explain than like the complicated systems I was thinking of before, because I initially had prepared another presentation. Um, it was just to introduce the true level system for this case. Okay. Different intuitive access to it or like. So, <laughs> so to... uh, what did Stern Gerlach do actually? Yeah, well, in the, they were the first, I think it was the first experiment to actually measure spin or like show that there's that um, quantum mechanical angular momenta don't behave like classical. Angular momentum, mm -hmm. and I think they uh, provided the general prototype of a measurement device, mm -hmm. a quantum mechanical measurement device. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all from the history of physics. I know about it. Okay. Small comment on it. Uh, they also measured uh, the that. Certain directions of the, the spin are not measurably or measurably oh, uh, together. If you put multiple, if you put multiple of yeah. these things, yeah. Yeah. it's also just yeah. Yeah. measure the kind of how quantum mechanical measurements all look like because of this. Uh, yeah. Com coming back to your question, when I, I mean, it sounds it sounds ex incredibly complicated at first hand. To do any physical physics measurement that ends up with a just as a linear operator, sounds like everything you just have to do is a linear operator. 
at least that that's what it sound sounds like why why is doing experiments so complicated if i just do linear operators all the time i mean building those experiments should be quite easy shouldn't it these measurement devices should be very easy work as the operators. So where is the problem there? With building, um, yeah, in practice, you also have preparing your state is the difficult, or one of the most difficult parts, mm -hmm. because of course, you're looking at macroscopic systems, and if you have like, Things flying around it, like electromagnetic fields suddenly emerging, as other system will interact with it, and you have a real large problem of getting an isolated state which you can measure out of it. The real problem is, and this is also one of the greatest, um, greatest uh, obstacles to overcome in quantum computing, is the so-called decoherence. If your uh, environment somehow, if you have uh, an isolated state somehow, and your environment somehow interacts with the with this with your particle which you prepared in your fully nice experimental setup. You it will destroy the state you just prepared. For instance, so could they have if they would have not chosen silver? As far as I if as far as I know, if they if um, they also chose I think hydrogen at one point. Is that correct? Isn't it? Um, okay. okay. Um, if they would not have chosen silver, then um, they would have seen the, they would have measured the total angular momentum of the atom, with, and they would have seen multiple spin ups. So um, I don't. I am not. Uh, so uh, silver is. Uh, they used silver because it was the only thing that worked. Uh, Stern had invented this molecular beam technique, yeah, uh, and he had done it all with silver atoms because silver has a low, relatively low melting uh, point, high vapor pressure, uh, and uh, and so it was relatively easy to prepare a molecular beam to silver atoms. That's why they chose silver. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, <there> <laughs> There was a lot of luck involved that they basically saw something that was almost the spin of a single electron. Almost. Attached to yeah. something very big, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> and why did it stay? stay? Why, why was it? You, you talked about uh, 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 decoherence and all these things. Why was this such a clear experiment? Mm, that's a good question. Um, oh, this here, this um, silver atoms into the beam. I mean, you don't have any. Like the system is probably very immune to, ex, to uh, outside excitations, so like they're prepared um, so the atoms don't care about the environment much, or uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if uh, uh, for this I'm, I have to say a bit lost why, why this is why this is happening, yeah, because I haven't because what you, what you get from the textbooks and so on is always like just the setup, not really the technical details why this was a good idea to use silver atoms. Mm. I always, as I said, I think it was pure luck. I don't want to diminish the work, but I think it was pure luck. Yeah, so oh, yeah. I mean, the motivation for this experiment was actually, they didn't know quantum mechanics as they tried it. They just knew Bohr's uh, model of the atom. Uh, and Bohr's model suggests uh, that the angular momentum is quantized. The orbital angular momentum, the orbitalized. And they were looking for this orbital angular momentum. And so the classical expectation would either be one spot, three spots, five spots, and so forth. Yeah. What they saw was two spots. Yeah. And that was the surprise. That's quite funny because yeah. in, in the text that you have been based on, the expectation was a, was a smearing out for the classical one. Yes, 
but because Bohr's, um, <coughs> Bohr's model postulates all of those um, radiation free orbits, mm -hmm. you, they wanted to show, they wanted to look if you can actually measure the, the, the angular momentum. They wanted to make, uh, they basically wanted to make a verification of Bohr's yeah. atomic model. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes interesting to know the history of these experiments, what they wanted to measure and what they found out. I sort of wonder how many teams tried to do something similar but got some detail of it wrong and just <laughs> gave up at some point. And I mean, also, you then have to be bold enough to say I did everything right, you know, and that's the result. <laughs> of course, we were. <laughs> of course, we were looking for this result. Obvious. Something not not inherent to to all the scientists. Uh, the greatest difficulty in this experiment was the vacuum, because at that time they didn't really have very good pumps, and uh, so they actually had to improve the uh, mercury diffusion pumps considerably in order to even make this experiment. And one of the long-standing critiques is what was that for some for some time that was actually called a fake experiment. They, I, I read a lot of literature and, and they actually called this a fake experiment in the beginning, since they were not sure that this level of vacuum could actually be reached. Right. Right. When was this done? 1925, roughly. Well, thank you very much, Thanks. Thanks.